So we arrive at our turn to sociogenesis. And Genesis is, of course, here, uh, obviously, even as we read both Yaus and Bakhtin for today, a misleading term uh, in a certain sense, because uh, obviously the most egregious difference between Yaus and Bakhtin, and once again, you're probably saying to yourself, well, my goodness, why have these two texts been put together? The most egregious difference is that uh, uh, Bakhtin's primary, primary concern is with the life world that produces uh, a text, uh, and Yaus's primary concern is with the life world, or perhaps better, succession of life worlds in which, in which a text is received. Uh, I think you can tell, however, from reading both texts and will be um, conscious uh, as, as you go through the materials that remain on the syllabus that the relationship between the production and reception of literature or of discourse of any kind, once you factor in the social setting of such a text becomes much more permeable, much more fluid. There's a certain sense in which the producer is the receiver, uh, in which the author is the reader. The author stands in relation to a tradition, to a past, as a reader. And the reader, in turn, uh, in continuing to circulate texts through history, that is to say, in playing a role as someone who keeps texts current, is perhaps, uh, even, concrete, even in concrete terms, a writer. That, that is to say, someone who expresses opinions, uh, circulates values, and keeps texts, as I say, in circulation. This, I mean, I've always felt this about, about Yaus's sense of what a reader is. Um, what kind of reader would it be who was responsible for the continued uh, presence, influence of a text through literary history who wasn't, in some sense, communicating an opinion. This is obviously truer today than ever before when we have blogs and discussion groups and when everybody, everybody is circulating opinions on the internet. Um, plainly, the reader, plainly the tastemaker, reader as tastemaker, uh, is at the same time a writer. Uh, just in passing, uh, this has become a digression, but I hope a useful one. Just in passing, in this context, one can think about uh, a really strange pairing, uh, Yaus in relation to Bloom. If Bloom's theory of strong misreading as a principle of literary historiography can be understood as a relationship between writers as readers and readers as writers, so, by the same token, if we see uh, Yaus's uh, analysis of reception in these terms, and if we think of reception as a necessary circulation of opinion, there is, after all, a sense in which for Yaus too, the reader is a writer and the writer is a reader. Um, that is uh, undoubtedly a remote con connection, but it is a way of seeing how both Bloom and Yaus are figures who have strong and interesting and plausible theories uh, about literary history. All right. To go, however, back to the beginning, back to the, the sense in which we're at a watershed uh, or moment of transition in this course, leaving for the moment uh, out of the picture the intermediate step of psychogenesis, uh, to go back to this sense of our being in a moment of transition, uh, as always, such as the calendar, just at the wrong time. We finally accomplish our transition. Then we go off for spring break, forget everything we ever knew, uh, and come back and start off uh, once again as a tabula rasa. But we'll do our best. We'll do, we'll, we'll do our best to bridge that gap. In any case, if we now find ourselves understanding in reading these two texts, for the first time, really, uh, although it's not that we haven't been talking about life before, obviously we have been, and it's not as though uh, the Russian formalists culminating in the structuralism of Jakobson don't talk about a referential function. I mean, it's, not, I mean, it's unfair even to the new critics to say that somehow the world is excluded from the interpretive or reading process, even though all along we've been saying things like this, we still sense a difference. 
The difference is in the perceived relationship between the text, the object of study, and the life world. The sense, in fact, in which a text is a life world. Uh, and this has, after all, something to do, something to do with our understanding of what language is. So far, we've been thinking of language as a semiotic code. Uh, or, and, and, and also, uh, with the strong suspicion that this semiotic code is a virtual one. We have been emphasizing the degree to which we are passive in relation to, or even as it were, spoken by this language. Uh, in other words, it's been a constant in our thinking about these matters that language speaks through us. But we have exercised so far a curious reticence about the sense in which this language is not just a code not just something that exists virtually at a given historical moment, but is in fact a code made up of other people's language. In other words, that it is language in circulation, not just language as somehow abstractly outside of networks of circulation available for use. So we begin now to think of language still and the relationship between language and speech. But now it's not a language abstracted from reality. It's a language which precisely circulates within reality uh, and as a matter of social exchange and social interaction. Language is now and henceforth on our syllabus a social institution. It has the same, in literary theory, it has the same determinative relationship with my individual speech. I mean, we now begin to understand uh, the claim that I don't speak my own language in a different register. Hitherto, it's been, well, language is there before me. What I speak is just sort of that which I borrow from it. But now, uh, this takes on a new valency altogether. What I don't speak is my language. It's other people's language, my voice. And the word voice is obviously, <coughs> is obviously under heavy pressure here. Even though nobody says it goes away, my voice is a voice permeated by all the sedimentations, registers, levels, orientations of language in the world that surrounds me. I take my language, in other words, from other people. I stand here uh, uh, for my sins, uh, lecturing in a kind of an ad lib way, uh, and that makes it even more pronounced in what I say. Uh, you're hearing the internet. You're hearing newspaper headlines. You're hearing slang. You're hearing all sorts of locutions and rhetorical devices that, it would, that I'd be ashamed to call mine, uh, uh, at, at least in many cases, because they are in the world. They're out there, as we say. And what's out there gets to the point where it's in here. And the next thing you know, it becomes part of the ongoing patter or blather of an individual. It is, in other words, the speech of others that you're hearing when you hear an individual. The extent or the degree to which this might be the case is, I suppose, always subject to debate. To debate. We're, going to, we're going to take up a couple of examples. But in, any set, but, but, but in any case, you can see that, that without the structure of the relationship between language and speech having really changed, and in fact, it won't really change as we, as we continue along, without the structure of the relationship between language and speech having changed, the nature of this relationship and the way in which we think of it in social terms uh, is changed, and the social aspect of it now comes into prominence. And, and will remain there. Now, in, in, in order to see how this works in the case of, our, of today's two authors a little more concretely, um, I wanted to turn uh, to, to a couple of passages on your sheet. Um, you got my grim warning last night that if, that if you didn't bring it, I wouldn't have any to circulate. Uh, we'll see how well that worked. 
Um, and if it didn't work well, perhaps it'll work better in the future. In any case, um, first of all, turning to the first passage on the sheet by Bakhtin. Um, by the way, if you don't have if you don't have the sheet, maybe somebody near you does, uh, or maybe somebody near you has a computer uh, which is being used for the correct purposes that can be <laughs> that 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 can be held somehow between the two of you. Uh, these are all possibilities. Uh, the, the 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 first the first passage on the sheet um, by Bakhtin uh, is about the relationship between what he takes to be a formalist understanding of double voicedness. Uh, whether, I mean, for example, the new critical understanding, which he, which he's not directly talking about, but which we could use as an example of irony, the the ways of talking about not meaning uh, what you say, uh, and he's talking about those sorts of double voicedness in relationship to, uh, in contradistinction to, uh, what he means um, by genuine heteroglossia. And he says, first passage on the sheet, rhetoric is often limited to purely verbal victories over the word, over ideological authority. In other words, uh, I'm, I'm sort of getting under your ribs uh, uh, if you're um, somehow or another uh, voicing uh, an authoritative or widespread or tyrannical opinion uh, by some form or another of subverting it. In other words, a kind of a, a binary relationship between what I'm saying and what's uh, commonly being said out there. <coughs> when this happens, when this happens, says Bakhtin, Rhetoric degenerates into formalistic verbal play. But we repeat, when discourse is torn from reality, it is fatal for the word itself as well. Words grow sickly, lose semantic depth and flexibility, the capacity to expand and renew their meanings in new living contexts. They essentially die as discourse, for the signifying word lives beyond itself, that is, it lives by directing its purposiveness outward. Double voicedness, which is merely verbal, is not structured on authentic heteroglossia, but on a mere diversity of voices. In other words, it doesn't take into account the way in which there is a seepage or permeabilities among the possibilities and registers of meaning, depending on extraordinarily complex uh, speaking communities coming together in any aspect of discourse, ways in which we have to think about the life world of a discourse in order to understand the play of voice. Heteroglossia, you know, is the language of others. That's what it means. In order to understand the way in which the language of others is playing through and permeating the text. Um, and so uh, uh, then uh, the, uh, a comparable resp response to formalism on the part of Hans Robert Jaus, uh, I should say in passing that both Bakhtin and Jaus have authentic and close relations with the Russian formalists. Bakhtin uh, begins in a way at the very end of the formalist tradition as a kind of second generation formalist, but quickly moves away, uh, which is breaking up in the late 1920s, and quickly moves away from that and begins to write a kind of, and, and begins to rewrite formalism in a certain sense uh, as um, a, a, a socio-genesis of discourse and of language. Uh, and by the same token, Yaus, uh, in his theory of literary history, which is not uh, enunciated in these terms in uh, where are these people? Which is, which is not enunciated in these terms in, um, in uh, the text that you have, but rather in the long text, uh, which, which I, in a way I wish your editor had taken, from which I wish your editor had taken an excerpt called uh, literary, literary History as a Provocation to uh, Literary Theory. You have, you have excerpts from that on, on your sheet. Um, in any case, in, in, in Yaus's understanding of the relationship 
um, between, um, be between the, the text and, and the life world, um, I've completely lost my, my place and my sense of what I'm doing. Oh, yes, I'm talking about the Russian formalists. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Russian formalists. Um, uh, yes, cobbles together, as it were, aspects of Russian formalist historiography, particularly that of Jakobsen and Tinyanov, um, and Mar a, a, a Marxist understanding of, as it were, the, uh, the, the, the marketing and reception uh, and consumption of literary production. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 these, and, and these pairs of ideas go together in his developing of his thesis about literary reception, to which we'll return at the end of the lecture. In, in other words, the, uh, the second passage on the sheet, um, which distances him, which, in which he, he wants to distance himself somewhat from both of these influences, uh, goes as follows. Early Marxist and formalist methods in common conceive the literary fact within the closed circle of an aesthetics of production and representation. In doing so, they deprive literature of a dimension that inalienably belongs to its aesthetic character as well as to its social function, the dimension of its reception and influence. In other words, the way in which a text, once it exists, moves in the world, the way in which it persists, changes as we understand it uh, and grows or diminishes uh, as time passes in the world. This is the medium, the social medium, in which Yaus wants to understand uh, uh, literary inter precisely literary interpretation, as we'll see. Coming a little closer to this issue of the relationship between thinking of this kind uh, and formalists, uh, formalist tradition, in Bakhtin, uh, on page 592, the left-hand column, uh, toward the bottom, I'm not going to quote this, I'm just going to say that it's there, uh, Bakhtin begins a sentence uh, about, as he puts it, literary parody understood in the narrow sense. Now, what he's implying here is that the theory of parody belongs primarily to Russian formalist literary historiography. In other words, the relationship between a new text and an old text is one of broadly conceived within this discourse, parody. Um, and so uh, Bakhtin picks up the word uh, parody in order to say also on page 592, also to say on page 592, uh, the left-hand column, um, about halfway down, a mere concern for language. Is, but, and that's an odd thing to say, a mere concern for language. Uh, a mere concern for language is but the abstract side of the concrete and active, i.e., dialogically engaged, understanding of the living heteroglossia that has been introduced into the novel and artistically organized within it. In other words, parody, if we, if, if we linger merely on that literary, on the literariness of parody, we simply don't have any grasp of the complexity of ways, of the ways in which uh, the dialogic uh, or the heteroglossal uh, uh, modulates uh, and ripples and makes complicated the surface of literary discourse. Parody, once again, leaves us with a sense of the, byron, of the binary. The, for, the previous text was this. Uh, the secondary text or the, late or, or the next text riffs off that previous text in a way that we can call parodic. Uh, but that's binary. That's just it's one text against another uh, and leaves out the whole question of, those, of that flood or multiplicity of voices. Uh, which, which pervades the text. OK, now, um, and, and so then uh, Yaus has an interesting moment, again, back on your sheet, uh, in which he is the fourth passage on your sheet, in which he is uh, obviously directly responding to that passage uh, at the end of Tinyanov's essay on literary evolution, which we've had on the board and which we've discussed before. 
You remember, Tinyanov makes the distinction between evolution, the way in which a sequence of texts uh, mutates, as one might say, the way in which, in other words, uh, successive texts, again, parody or alter uh, uh, what was in the previous text, and modification, which is the influence uh, on texts from the outside by other sorts of historical factors which may lead to textual change. And Tinyanov says that it's important uh, actually for both studies, for the study of history and also for the study of literary history, that the two be always kept clearly distinct um, in the mind of, of the person looking at them. Well, Yaus's response to that is perhaps chiefly rhetorical, but it nevertheless once does mark this shift in the direction of the understanding of language as social that I've been wanting to begin by emphasizing. Yaus says, the connection between literary evolution and social change, that is to say those features in society that would and do modify texts, the connection between literary evolution and social change does not vanish from the face of the earth through its mere negation. What is he saying? He's saying does not vanish from the face of the earth because Tinya, Tinyanov said it did. Right? <laughs> I mean, this, th th there is no doubt that, that, that that's the passage uh, uh, Yaus is talking about. The new literary work, he goes on, is received and judged against the background of the everyday experience of life. In other words, the work exists in a life world. There is no easy or possible way of distinguishing between its formal innovations and those sorts of innovations which are produced by continuous and ongoing factors of social change. They interact, uh, they seep into one another in exactly the same way that all the registers and sedimentations of human voices uh, uh, interact and seep into one another in Bakhtin's heteroglossia. All right, so these then are the emphases of both of these writers with respect to formalist ideas which have played a prominent part in most, if not all, of the uh, literary theory that we have studied, that we've studied up until now. <coughs> All right, now I'd like to linger a little while with Bakhtin uh, uh, and then uh, b before turning back to Yaus. Now, heteroglossia, uh, or diversity of speech, as he calls it sometimes, he says at one point, again on page 592, uh, toward the top of the left hand column, Heteroglossia is what he calls the ground of style. And I, want to, and, and I want to pause to ask a little bit what he might mean by this expression, the ground of style, the, the italicized passage. It is precisely the diversity of speech and not the unity of a normative shared language that is the ground of style. In other words, I don't, when I speak, and I've already said, of course, when I speak, I'm not speaking to you in, a, in an official voice. I'm not speaking uh, uh, the king's English. Uh, in fact, um, on this view, there's really no such thing as the king's English. Nobody speaks the king's English because there is no such, no such isolated, distilled entity that one can point to. Uh, language, at least the language of most of us. Uh, that is to say, of everyone except uh, people in hermetically sealed environments, like, for example, um, a peculiarly privileged, uh, inward looking aristocracy. The language of virtually all of us is the language of the people, the language of others. And it is that which we have to continue uh, to think about. Um, as, we, as, as we consider how a style is generated. We speak of a style as though it were a question of, purely a question, of an authorial signature. Sometimes we think of style and signature as synonymous. Oh, I would recognize that style anywhere. Coleridge said of Wordsworth, of a few lines of Wordsworth, if I'd come across these lines in the desert, I'd have said Wordsworth. 
Well, obviously, there's a certain sense, there's a certain sense in which we do recognize a style. For example, the style of Jane Austen. I suppose, arguably, you 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 could think that this is the style of Dr. Johnson, but most people would recognize it as the style of Jane Austen. And yet at the same time, as we'll see in a minute, uh, it is a style made up in ways that are very difficult finally to factor out and analyze of many voices. Um, okay, so, so um, this would suggest, I think, uh, this idea of a style as a composite of speech sedimentations. This idea would suggest that possibly there isn't a voice that to speak of an authorial voice would be a very difficult matter. Um, and in fact, and, and, and might lead us to ask, does this move the idea that the sociolect speaks through the idiolect, the idea that the idea that the language of everyone is in fact the language that speaks my speech, my, my peculiar uh, individual speech? Um, does this once again bring us face to face with that dreary topic, the death of the author? Uh, I don't think so, not quite. Certainly not in Bakhtin, um, who gives us a rather bracing sense of, of the importance of the author in a passage on page 593, the right-hand column. He says, it is as if the author, uh, this is of course sort of coming face to face with the problem of whether there still is an author. He says, it is as if the author has no language of his own but does possess his own style, his own organic and unitary law governing the way he plays with languages. So style is perhaps a, a one's particular way of mediating and allocating the diversity of voice that impinges on what one's saying. Uh, and the way his own real semantic and expressive intentions are refracted within them. And here, Bakhtin saves or preserves the author by invoking the principle of unifying intention and the way in which we can recognize it in the discourse of any given novel. Of course, he goes on, this play with languages and frequently the complete absence of a direct discourse of his own in no sense degrades the general deep-seated intentionality, the overarching ideological conceptualization of the work as a whole. So this is not, uh, though it may seem to be in certain respects, a question of the death of the author as provoked by, let's say, Foucault uh, or Roland Barthes at, at the beginning of the semester. So it's not that um, exactly. All of it, all of everything that we've been saying so far can be seen to work in a variety of novels. The novel is the privileged genre for Bakhtin. He, I think, perhaps somewhat oversimplifying in this, uh, reads the novel, the emergence of the novel, the flowering and richness of the novel against the backdrop of genres he considers to be monoglossal, uh, the epic, uh, which simply speaks the unitary voice of an aristocratic tradition, the lyric, which simply speaks the unitary voice of the sort of isolated romantic solipsist, um, and over against that and over against that you get the polyglossal, rich, uh, multiple, multiplicity of voice in the novel. As I say, I think that this, I think that the generic contest is somewhat oversimplified because nothing is easier and more profitable than to read both epic and lyric uh, as, uh, as manifestations of heteroglossia. Just think of the Iliad. What are you going to do if you really believe that it's monoglossal with the speeches of Thersites? Well, you know, okay. Um, in, a, in any case, the basic idea, however, um, is I think extraordinarily rich and important. And I thought we could try it out by uh, taking a look for a moment at the first sentence of Pride and Prejudice, which I'm sure most of you know, um, and is plainly uh, an example of the relationship between what, uh, what Bakhtin calls common language, it is a truth universally acknowledged, in other words, it's, it's, it's in everybody's mouth, you know, uh, plainly a result of the relationship between common language and something like authorial reflection or what he elsewhere calls internally persuasive discourse. Uh, now, 
In traditional parlance, this would be a speech which manifests irony, the rhetoric of irony against which uh, Bakhtin sets himself in the first passage on your sheet. Um, I mean, how ridiculous, it, uh, we say. Uh, Jane Austen doesn't believe this. Um, this is drawing room wisdom. Um, and everything in the sentence points to the ways in which it's obviously wrong even while it's being called a truth. Universally, meaning the thousand people or so who matter. Uh, in other words, there are a great many people who neither acknowledge nor care about any such thing. Um, that, uh, that, um, and, and then, of course, the idea that um, a single man uh, in possession of a good fortune, or indeed otherwise, uh, has nothing to do um, but, um, but be in want of a wife. Uh, and, that, um, and, and so obviously, um, this, is, this is what is being said by not the man in the street, um, but by uh, drawing room culture. Now, even before we turn to the ways in which uh, the, the, the complication of the ways in which the sentence is being undermined, uh, bear in mind that the plot of the novel confirms the truth. In other words, Darcy and Bingley, both of them in possession of a good fortune, do turn out very plainly to have been in want of a wife and, in fact, procure one uh, by the end of the novel. That is precisely what the plot is about, so that the conventions governing the plot of Pride and Prejudice altogether confirm the truth that is, in, uh, that is enounced in this sentence, even though it is a truth that is plainly to be viewed ironically. That in itself is, is, is quite extraordinary and I think reinforces our sense uh, that this is one of the great uh, first sentences uh, in the history of fiction. But, but now turning to the way in which we can think of it as something other than a simple irony. Of course, there's this word want. We've been thinking a lot about want lately because we've just gone through uh, our psychoanalytic phase. What exactly does this single, <laughs> what, 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 is this, what does this single man really want? You know, I mean, in a way, in a way, the, 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 the subtle pun in the word want, which means both to desire and to lack. You know, if I lack something, I don't necessarily desire it. I just don't happen to have it, right? But on the other hand, if I want something, I can also be said to desire it. Um, well, what? Well, which is it? Which is it? Uh, is it a, a kind of lack um, that social pressure of some sort um, is 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 calculated to fill, or is it desire? And if it's desire, what on earth does it have to do with a good fortune? I mean, the, 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 the el there are elements of the romance plot which raise precisely that question. You know, uh, desire has nothing to do um, with fortune. Uh, convenience, social acceptability, comfort, all of those things have to do with fortune. But desire, we suppose, uh, having passed through our psychoanalytic phase, um, to be of a somewhat different nature. And so the complication of the sentence has to do actually with the question of the way in which these, the meanings of these words can be thought to be circulating and to create ripples of irony of their own far more complicated than, oh, you know, the author is much smarter than that. She doesn't mean that, which is already a complication introduced uh, by the fact that her plot bears it out. How can her plot bear it out if she's being so ironic? You know, and and of course there's there's obviously um, there, there's obviously a good deal uh, more to say. Uh, the um, um, the a single man in possession of a good fortune uh, uh, obviously may not at all want a wife um, for a variety of reasons that one could mention and that can't be possibly completely absent from Jane Austen's mind. Uh, can, and so you know that has to be taken to account uh, uh, in itself and certainly. And certainly does, uh, <laughs> Michaela. You've you've darkened us. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, it's okay. I think it's this one. Uh, well, we may have to remain dark. I don't want to take up too much time with it. No one's anymore. Okay, okay. Um,
Yeah, this is this is this is all right. This this is all right. And it, it 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 puts the sentence in a whole new perspective. So perhaps, per, 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 perhaps perhaps I'll stop there. Um, but I think but I, I think you see it's the sort it's the sort of se- sentence that bears reflection. Uh, oh, by the way, is, am I still visible? Uh, <laughs> that, that bears reflection um, uh, beyond you know a kind of simple binary of uh, the sentence um, is spoken by. Um, by the man in the drawing room, the or woman in the drawing room, it's uh, it's idiotic. Um, it's obviously wrong. Um, we simply can't say that. The style of the author is a style that is sedimented by and through uh, complexities of circulated meaning that really can't be limited by any sense of one-to-one relation of that kind. She didn't touch any. Of, she didn't touch any of those. Uh, I've just made it darker. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so yes, all right. Um, what else about Bakhtin? One more thing. Um, the, his idea of common language, this is, a, this is not a concept that is supposed to have any particular, any one particular value attached to it. It's a little bit like, like the rhizome. Uh, it, c- it could be good, it could be bad. Common language could be a kind of Rabelaisian, carnivalesque, subversive, energetic uh, body of voices from below, uh, overturning the apple carts of authority uh, and, 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 and the fixed ways uh, of a moribund social order. Could be that. Uh, but at the same time, it could itself be the authoritative, the reactionary, the mindless. Common language would be that universality of acknowledgment uh, which seems to go along with um, unreflected uh, knee-jerk responses to what one observes and thinks about. Um, Common language has that whole range. The important thing about it is that it's out there and that it circulates. And And it exists in relationship with what Bakhtin calls internally persuasive discourse. In other words, the way in which the filtering together of these various sorts of language uh, result in something like um, what we feel to be authentic, a power of reflection, uh, a, 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 a posing of relation among the, variety, the, the various st- st- uh, strata of language um, such that they can speak uh, authentically. Not necessarily in a way that we agree with, uh, but in a way that we recognize to constitute that distilled consciousness that we still do call the author, and to which we ascribe, in some sense, um, authority. We feel um, precisely in the uh, peculiar uh, self-mocking relationship between this sentence of Pride and Prejudice and the plot of Pride and Prejudice as a whole, we feel something like the internal persuasiveness, the coherence of the discourse. Um, and um, I think maybe just to, just to sum up Bakhtin, I want to quote you from the other uh, long um, excerpt that you have in your anthology, which I would encourage you to read. Sometimes I have asked people to read it, but I decided to drop it this year. But it's still a very strong uh, and interesting argument. It's called Discourse in the Novel. And I just want to read in the left-hand column, near the, near the bottom of the column, the, ide- the ideological becoming of a human being, in this view, is the process of selectively assimilating the words of others. That is the coherence of my mind, of what I say, insofar as it exists, is the result of selecting out, of selecting among 
in my assimilation of the words of others such that there is a pattern of, again, coherence. Uh, all right, so finally, the novel is the social text par excellence for Bakhtin for these reasons, and it confirms again what we've been saying of, about a new way of thinking of language. Language as that which speaks us is not just language, it's other people's language. And we need to understand uh, the experience of the process of reading and of texts as they exist and the nature of authorial comp composition as a, a, an assimilative, selective way of putting together other people's language. All right, now quickly, Yaus. He takes us back, obviously, uh, by way of Ezer. Uh, I think you can see that, uh, that Yaus's talk about uh, horizons of expectation, uh, the disruption of expectation, has a great deal to do with Ezer's understanding of the role of the reader in filling imaginative gaps that are left in the text, uh, that, uh, which are based on uh, a complex relationship with a set of conventional expectations, by way of Ezer to Gadamer. Because after all, uh, what Yaus has to say uh, is a way of talking about Gadamer's merger of horizons. But for Yaus, it's not just my horizon and the horizon of the text. It's not just those two horizons that need to meet halfway uh, on common ground uh, as mutually illuminating. It is, in fact, a succession of horizons changing as, as modes of aesthetic and interpretive response to texts are mediated historically, uh, as I say, in a sequence. Uh, it's not just the text was once a certain thing. Now we feel it to be somehow different. Uh, and in order to understand it, we need to meet it halfway. It's rather a matter of self-consciously studying what has happened in between that other time and this here and now. The text has had a life. It has passed through life changes. And these life changes are, have to be understood at each successive stage in terms of the three moments of hermeneutic grasp as described by Gadamer uh, in the historical section of Truth and Method. The distinction between intelligere, uh, explicare, and applicare, understanding, interpretation, and application that Yaus talks about at the beginning of his essay actually goes back to the 18th century. And what Yaus has to say about it is, yes, these three moments of hermeneutic understanding exist for any reader or reading public at any moment uh, in the history of the reception of a text. He makes a considerable to-do about distinguishing between the aesthetic response to the text and a subsequent or, or leisured, reflectively interpretive response to, this, to the text. And this may seem a little confusing because he admits, with Heidegger and others, as, 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 we've, as we've indicated ourselves in the past, that uh, you can't just have uh, a spontaneous uh, uh, response to anything without reflection. There's always a sense in which you already know what it is, which is to say a sense in which you've already interpreted it. Uh, but at the same time, Yaus makes a considerable point of distinguishing between these two moments, the, 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 the aesthetic, which he associates with understanding, Understanding and the uh, uh, and 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 the interpretive, which he associates with what is in the hermeneutic tradition called uh, interpretation. Now, why does he do this? It's a question of what he means by the aesthetic. A text enters historical circulation and remains before <coughs> the gaze of successive audiences in history because it has been received. Aesthetically. Aesthetics is the glue that keeps the text alive through history. In other words, people continue to say, to one degree or another, I like it. If they don't say, I like it, 
there will never be a question of interpreting it or, or transmitting it historically because it's going to disappear. As Dr. Johnson said, that book is good in vain, which the reader throws away. In other words, from the, sta from the, from the standpoint of interpretation or from the standpoint of philosophical reflection or whatever you might wish to call it, um, a book may be good, just, just incontestably good. But if it didn't please, if it didn't give pleasure, if it didn't sort of attach itself to a reading public aesthetically by means of pleasing, none of what would succeed in the, in, in, in the hermeneutic uh, process could ever take place. So that's, that's why uh, uh, Yaus uh, makes such a point of distinguishing between the aesthetic and the interpretive. And then, of course, the, the historical uh, study of reception is what shows us the degree to which any set of uh, moments of, as, uh, of, of aesthetic and interpretive reception is mediated by what has gone before it. In other words, a text gradually changes as a result of its reception, and if we don't study it, we are left naively supposing that it really hasn't, that the time has passed, that the past has become sort of remote from us, so we have certain problems interpreting, but these problems haven't arisen from anything that could properly be called change. Uh, that there has been uh, an unfolding process of successive interpretations whereby a text has gone through sea changes, it's become less popular, more popular, more richly interpreted, less richly interpreted, uh, but tends to keep eddying out from what it was sensed to be originally to the point where all sorts of, of, of accretive uh, implications and sources of pleasure may arrive as we understand it. In a certain sense, once again, it's like Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote, but now it's not just Pierre, Pierre uh, Menard and Miguel de Cervantes, it's as though a succession of people, perhaps writing, you know, perhaps whose native language was not French necessarily, but who knows, German, Russian, whatever, uh, continuing to write uh, in Spanish uh, a text which turns out to be word for word uh, Don Quixote as the centuries pass. Each one acquiring a whole new uh, world of associations and implications and giving pleasure in successively new ways. And when we finally get to the point in the late 19th century when we encounter this Frenchman, Pierre Menard, writing Don Quixote, the important thing would be to understand that lots of people have done it between him and Cervantes. This, uh, on this, this as a kind of skeletal model of how a reception history, according to Yaus, might work. Now, at the history of reception studies two things. Uh, it studies uh, changing horizons of expectation, uh, and that's something you're familiar with uh, from Ezer, that is to say, the way in which uh, a reader has to come to terms with uh, conventions surrounding expectation in any given text in order to be able to negotiate what's new and what's nearly, uh, merely culinary in the text. Uh, it involves changing horizons of expectations, which don't, which don't just change once in the here and now, but have changed successively through time. And it also involves changing semantic possibilities, uh, or if you will, changing possibilities for and of significance. What does the text mean for me now? But understood, again, not just as something that matters for me, but has successively mattered for successive generations of readers in between. Just to take uh, examples of how this might work in the here and now, um, there is just now on Broadway a revival of Dan Yankees, uh, which is about a baseball player who sells his soul uh, in order to beat the Yankees. Uh, and one can't help but think that the revival of interest in Dan Yankees has something to do with the steroid scandals uh, and the way in which so many baseball players do sell their souls in order to win and in order to have good careers. Uh, and it occurs to one that it is that it is in this sort of atmosphere of social and cultural censure uh, that we're suddenly interested in Dan Yankees again. 
perhaps there will be a revival of Tony the tow truck. Uh, because in the economic downturn, uh, obviously to be rich or to be glamorous, you know, speedy, or to be busy, you know, to be, yeah, you know, all of, the, all, all of this becomes obsolete, um, uh, more or less irrelevant and beside the point. And what really matters is little guys helping each other, you know. And so, uh, and so, and so Tony the tow truck could, can be revived today uh, as a parable of the good life in the downturn. Uh, and, and so it will probably be uh, read by everyone. Uh, give, it will give pleasure. It will therefore be interpreted. Uh, and it will survive to live another day historically, uh, fulfilling the three moments of uh, the study of the history of reception uh, required by Yaus. All right. So with that said, it's been a very interesting 50 minutes, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with, that, with that said, I hope you all have a good break, uh, and we'll see you when you get back.